bring you in more than Zion Reese, and this is the Bigger High School News Report 2013. We want to bring you today's news from Bigger High School. Wait, did you know that today, Thursday the 21st of March, is Bigger High School Charity Day? No, what's it for? It's for Teenage Cancer Trust. So that's a good cause. I'm talking to Jared and Alex. Why did you choose Teenage Cancer Trust? Uh, we chose to raise money for Teenage Cancer Trust because uh, it's a really great charity for a start. Also, um, in the past, pupils from our school have had to use the charity during really sad times during their lives, so we thought it would be a good idea to raise some money for them. Okay. Why do you think charity days are a good idea? Charity days are a good idea because, as Alice has said, it is a really good cause to raise money for, and we feel that due to someone actually using the service, that it will benefit all of us and it's kind of close to home uh, due to someone actually having to use Teenage Cancer Trust as a service. Uh, we just feel that it's a really good thing to raise money to. Also, it lets all you guys have a nice day of fun uh, instead of having to do classwork all the time. You may get to watch a, a DVD or and also at, at break and lunch you get entertainment. So we'll hopefully have a nice day. What type of activities were planned for the charity day? Uh, we've already had uh, quite a few activities this week already. We had a few sporting events, we had uh, a dodgeball game, tournament rather, and a ping pong tournament also between the staff and the seniors. Um, and today we've got a series of really exciting events. Everyone's in fancy dress obviously and we're going to have some people gunging. But also, Jared will be having his head shaved for charity. Yeah. And that's going to be something that's really going to hopefully raise a lot of money and raise everyone's spirits as well. Inspiration from Jesse J. <coughs> That's what we are doing at Bigger High School today. Now over to National News. In autumn 2014, Scotland's people will be going to the polls to decide if Scotland should become an independent country. The government is debating if 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds should be able to vote. Now I'm going to ask Caitlin some questions. Do you think it will be a good thing for Scotland? No, because I think that without England, Scotland will be worse off economically and politically. Do you think 16-year-olds and up should be allowed to vote? No, because I don't think they're responsible enough and I don't think they have enough knowledge to make the decision to make. Thank you. Thank you. Jude, I'm going to ask Al some questions. Do you think it will be good for Scotland to become independent? Uh, no, because I think they will struggle politically without the rest of the UK, as they'll have to re-enter the Euro, uh, the European Union, and it will just be a bit of a hassle for them. Um, and do you think 16-year-olds enough should be allowed to vote? Uh, no, I don't think they're responsible enough to take such a serious matter into their hands, really. Um, thank you. Then I'm going to be asking Callum some questions. Do you think the independence will be a good thing for Scotland? Uh, no, I think it would be a bad idea for Scotland personally because uh, it will be hard to fund the country through taxes uh, without without the extra taxes and um, it should be quite difficult on our own, I think. And do you think 16-year-olds should be allowed to vote? Uh, I do think they should be allowed to vote because through their lifetime they'll have decisions that will make most effect, so it's very important they have a vote, I believe. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. I'm here to talk to Stephen slash Dorothy about the independence. <coughs> Do you think it would be good, a good thing for Scotland? Yes, because at the moment Scotland has very few <coughs> seats in Parliament, so they don't really have much say. So if they had independence, they could like run the country better. Do you think sixteen-year-olds and up should be allowed to vote? Yeah, because I mean, it wouldn't hurt if sixteen-year-olds vote because most of us would vote for independence anyway. So. Thank you. No problem. I'm now going to speak to Dr. Taylor. Do you think it would be a good thing for Scotland? Um, at this stage, I, I don't believe so. Um, I think the Scottish Parliament in its present form, perhaps with one or two more powers, um, can do plenty for Scotland. And I'd like to see it um, doing more things um, politically and in Scotland for um, full independence. I think we've got a lot of um, advantages. Um, in associating ourselves with um, the English Parliament at this time. Do you think 16-year-olds and up should be allowed to vote? Oh yes I do. 
Um, I think six-year-olds definitely should be allowed to vote, but um, I have my concerns about 16-year-olds voting in the forthcoming election because I don't think they should be voting in this election if they're not allowed to vote in other elections. So I think 16-year-olds should vote, but I think they should be able to vote in all elections, not just this one. Thank you. Thank you for those interviews. Now we'll move to international stories. First to Colm, our science correspondent. My name is Colm and I am reporting on a supposed cure for HIV. This has been a problem for years now and French scientists think they may have finally found a solution. They have been trying the drug on 14 people and since they have stopped being treated, no signs of the virus have been found. They began formulating the drug after a baby girl in the USA had apparently been cured of the illness. But so far the drug only works on young people because they have not yet fully acquired the virus. The lucky group of 10 patients that have so far been cured all got this treatment within 10 be weeks of being diagnosed. They turned up at hospital with symptoms and HIV was found in their blood. So far, for people that have had the virus for a long time, the drug only keeps the virus at bay and can not find all the nooks and crannies where the HIV hides. Usually the drug is stopped and cleared. Well, usually when the drug is stopped and cleared of the body, the illness slowly comes back. We hope that if patients are treated early enough, the virus will have no time to hide and patients can be completely cured. Now back to Reese and Lauren. Now to a sadder story abroad. Hello and welcome to Bigger High School News Report. This is Natalie Mark Sinclair reporting on the city of Massacre. In the small town of Hazwaya, a horrible and savage attack was made on the people of this town. Syria is an all-round violent country and Assad's allies used chemical weapons in an attack against the people of this town. The footage we saw showed us how horrible it was. There was used bullets and blood everywhere. The gang Shahiba was to blame for this huge massacre. An army commander told the BBC how hundreds of men from the organisation appeared in a secretive rebel aligned group known for men with black clothing and long beards came across the fields from nearby Talbisa on the morning of Tuesday the 15th of January. We found evidence to support reports from Syria of a massacre this week in which at least 100 people were killed and burned in their homes. A team visited the village of Viswaya on the edge of the central city of Homs and saw charred bodies still lying inside one of the houses. Government soldiers said all the bodies had been taken away and blamed Islamist militants fighting with the rebels. One villager told the BBC the army was present at the time of the deaths. In a separate development, reports emerged on of the deaths of two journalists covering the conflict in Syria. The day before, a French journalist was shot dead in the northern city of Aleppo, opposition activists said. The Apollo uh, Media Centre also blamed a sniper for killing a journalist. Rez uh, Dubai, although one activist said it's not clear behind his death. Uh, reports of a massacre at Haswaya emerged on Thursday from opposition and human rights activists, but they could not be verified immediately. This was a tragic and hor horrific experience for the people of Haswaya. It was also horrible to hear about. This is Natalie Mark Sinclair reporting for BBC Schools for 2013. Now to our story, which has galloped into our newsroom. Hello, I am Kirsten. And I'm Lucy. Today, we're going to talk about the horsemeat scandal. A staggering 10 million burgers have been taken off the shelves of a local supermarket such as Tesco, Lidl and Aldi because they contain up to 26% horsemeat. We have also discovered that Burger King, along with other large fast food chains, have changed their meat suppliers just in case. People are avoiding the cut price supermarket deals in wake of the horsemeat scandal. Instead, people are going to the local butcher's mill. The horsemeat scandal is a bonus for Clydesdale butchers. The recent finding of horsemeat has resulted in scores of shoppers racing to quality Clydesdale butchers for their red meat. Many members of the public no longer trust the leading supermarkets to provide healthy meat that is labelled correctly. Butchers say that fresh meat is an important part of a healthy and balanced diet and we should eat more of it. Processed meat is bad for your body and can result in deadly diseases. We have been researching some horse meat jokes. Here are our top four. Those Aldi horse burgers were nice, but I prefer my little pony. Health and safety executives confirmed that all those who ate horse burgers are in stable condition. My doctor told me to watch what I eat, so I bought tickets for the Grand National. We have only just discovered the horse meat in lasagnas because the cheese on top was mascarpone. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye. Those were good jokes. Now to a very local story. Hello, I am Erin and we are here with the news about the Country Roads story. David Coulthard has made a new advert on TV about country roads in Scotland and how dangerous they can be. 
On this advert, he talks about a crash that has happened in, on bigger roads and how dangerous country roads can be at all times. This advert also takes you through what the car has been through with a simulator that David called her tests find that we found out the car had been through a few things before the actual crash. We drive on these roads every day and drivers will take more care on the roads because of this advert. Now back to Reese and Lauren. Over to our sports reporters now with football and golf. This is Sam reporting on our story from USA. Last Tuesday, a golfer in the USA fell into an 18 feet sinkhole. Mark Mihal was playing on golf with three friends in Illinois last week when the incident occurred. Mark had gone to check the distance for his partner when he suddenly disappeared into a bell-shaped hole 18 feet deep and 10 feet wide. I noticed this hole in the fairway and went to have a look at it. But by the time I took one step, I was gone. I was underground, Mr. Me Howe told the Daily Mail. I felt the ground start to collapse, and it happened so fast that I couldn't do anything, Mr. Me Howe said to the website Golf Mania. I reached for the ground as I was going down, and it gave away too. It seemed like I was falling for a long time. The real scary part was that I didn't know when I would hit the bottom and what I would land on. He landed on the mud floor hard, dislocating his shoulder. After hearing his moans, the other members of the group attempted to rescue him. They rang the club's shop, first assuring the manager that they were not Frank calling him and told him that a member of their group really had fallen into a sinkhole. The clubhouse rang for an ambulance and attempted to rescue Mr. Mihao using a ladder and rope. The ladder was not tall enough to reach him. Mr. Mihao could not pull himself up to the ladder and was beginning to panic. His wife, Lori, said golf mania that, told Golf Mania that he suffers from claustrophobia and was beginning to panic and was in shock. Eventually, one of the former foursome, Ed Magaletta, volunteered to go down and get him out. He made a sling for Mr. Meehow's arm out of his sweatshirt, tied a rope around him, and helped to hoist him up the ladder. Mr. Meehow was a regular on the Anne Briar course, says he currently has no plans to return. I think it was just a little too weird, he said. I don't think I'd be very comfortable playing that hole again. I am here with the football pundit, Daniel. Hello there, Daniel. Hello. We'd like to ask you a few questions about Scottish football and its impact in Europe. I think that this is a big issue at the moment, Robbie. After Celtic's success in the Champions League, there is the question of whether they will be able to do it again or will any other Scottish football teams do well in Europe? Do you think that there is a main reason for this? I think that quite a lot of it is down to money. The TV companies will pay big money for the rights to show games to those leagues which have lots of well-supported teams, as they will get big money from the advertisers. So the teams in these leagues will have the money to buy the best players in the world. Where does Scotland come into this? Scotland won't be able to get big money through TV deals, because they will never get big TV audiences. Maybe one of the big, well-supported Scottish clubs would be bought over by a multi-billionaire like Chelsea or Manchester City were. But that might ruin the rest of Scottish football because the league wouldn't be very interesting. I think that if Scottish football is to have an impact in Europe, then teams need to try different options like fan ownership. This is what Barcelona do and they are possibly the best team in the world. How do we get more Scottish teams competing in the European competitions? There is a very complicated formula where you have a look at your team's league and European performances over the last five years and give you points that decide a place in a European competition. Recently, the Celtic manager Neil Lennon said that if his club is to do well in Europe again, they will need to get major funds over the transfer window. Do you think that this is true? I do, Robbie. I think that the game of football is changing and if a team wants to succeed, then they will have to find money from somewhere if they are to stand a chance of competing in Europe. Thank you, Daniel. So could Celtic, the first ever British team to win the European Cup, never be able to contend for it again? And could a Scottish football club ever win in Europe? Back to you in this meeting. That's all from Bigger High School today for the BBC News Report. Thank you.